Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode seven, I believe, of Weekly Oscar Talk. Seven weeks into it, um, going strong. I'm joined this week with Anthony. Hi, everyone. And there's not a ton to talk about in the whole realm of news and such, but there's still a little bit. So, starting off with our first piece, we have um, West Side Story got its first initial reactions a little bit out on social media. Um, if you saw my October Oscar predictions, I boldly had this to win Best Picture. We'll have to see if that still happens, but you never know. Um, but its first reactions came out. Um, they're kind of hard to find, so I'm just going to read one of them. Um, Jeremy, but they're all kind of the same consensus here. Um, Jeremy Wayne says, the new West Side Story is absolutely fantastic. Clearly a ton of love and care went into it. And while the entire cast is phenomenal, Rita Moreno is the heart of the, is the, heart of the whole thing. And the orchestrations are beautiful. And the film is absolutely worth seeing in theaters. And then he added on at the end, if I have to make my awards predictions, Feist, DeBose, and Rita Moreno would have my money in terms of acting noms. So I still have a lot of faith in this being a huge juggernaut in a lot of categories, including picture. I think Spielberg could sneak in for director, all that stuff. How, how are you feeling about this movie, Anthony? I gotta say, I'm feeling a lot better about it after this weekend for multiple reasons. Um, of course, one of the more tragic ones is Stephen Sondheim's passing which I think people want to celebrate him. I think we saw that this past weekend, you know, people, um, both, you know, fans and also big name talent coming to celebrate him uh, around. I mean, I haven't seen uh, probably since Chadwick and maybe Carrie Fisher, the amount of reactions and the sharing of how one individual meant so much to this person. Kobe Bryant too, I feel like was in this yeah. in category. Um, but for that, for, for it to be a man who was 91, I think is extraordinarily special because it wasn't that we were reacting tragically to a life cut too soon. This is somebody that I think people really love. I mean, look at Tick, Tick, Boom. That's basically a love letter to Stephen Sondheim. So I think that will help people because I think, you know, I always try to differentiate, you know, with Furious 7, people really wanted to go honor Paul Walker. And that's why I think that movie became as big as it did. Um, Carrie Fisher, though, last Jedi came underneath Force Awakens. So it's kind of, it's always kind of hard. Like, will mm -hmm. people want to go out to support the like the person and honor their memory? How much will that affect like the attention? But I do think that there will be a lot of attention now on West Side Story as a way to honor him. And I, based on these reactions too that we've been coming to see, it seems that this is a really refreshing take. It seems that there's a lot new to this. I think you a lot more than I expected. Um, I think Tony Kushner, who's a screenwriter, who of course, I believe won a Pulitzer for Angels in America, is a very established writer, uh, theatrical playwright. And it seems that he really understood the assignment. Uh, I've, I've heard that like 40% of the movie is in Spanish, which I think is a really great idea to explore. I believe the Broadway revival in the, I think 2009 did something similar with the songs. But that, I mean, that's great because again, it gives this what I've always been looking for and worrying about what's the point of the, what's the purpose of this film? And I think we're seeing that there is a clear purpose and a clear focus. I did put it now in my best picture nominees. I think I have it in the eight position. I still think it's going to be hard for any remake, especially of a best picture winner to really go all the way. Uh, but I think it's definitely in, the, in, in contention for a nomination. I put Spielberg in there now taking my Adam McKay spot because I think he could be a late breaker, the type of like, he hasn't done this in a while. He's kind of, he's, it's similar to when Julia Roberts got nominated for August Osage County. It was like, she's, she's do something like this or Tom Hanks in a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I think that could be Spielberg with this nomination, especially if it performs. And I think it will perform. I honestly think that out of all the December releases, it's gonna be No Way Home and West Side Story. I think those are gonna be the ones that are gonna make the money. Maybe Matrix, we'll see. Um, and as far as some actors go, I really, I'm like, Ariana DeBose or Rita Moreno? I can't yeah, gotta pick. get in that spot. Currently I have DeBose, but I don't know. I really don't know. I, it could go Moreno. It depends, I think, on how much of the movie she's in. Because of, of course yeah. DeBose is gonna have more of screen time and i feel like even maybe rita moreno be like listen 
give it to the person who's doing my role now. She's deserving yeah. of it. You know, instead of giving it to me twice, give it to, you know, the new star. So I'm definitely more open to it. And I actually think it may end up getting that cinematography spot too. Uh, that fifth oh, spot. Yeah. yeah. I, it looks I, from I, the trailers really good. So yeah. I would think it would get in. Yeah. Who definitely. did, um, who of the top five do you not have in director? If you kicked out Adam McKay. I, so my current director lineup is Jane Campion winning, and I feel pretty strongly about that uh, for Power of the Dog. Uh, my second position is Paul Thomas Anderson for Licorice Pizza, uh, which is really building momentum yeah. uh, here. Yeah. Uh, that is currently, I think I mentioned in a past episode, currently still my number one for Best Picture. I think that's the front runner. Oh, cool. um, or at least I think it, I don't know if it's the front runner status, but I feel that that is the, the movie that's going to win in March. Yeah. Uh, third, I have Denis Villeneuve for Dune. Uh, wonderful spectacle, but as we said in a previous episode, Dune Part 2 is coming, so we have the potential yeah. to award him with that. My fourth position is Kenneth Branagh for Belfast. I feel that, that he will get in, though I do worry he's an Aaron Sorkin Trial the Chicago 7 nominee, or Bradley Cooper awesome. Star Horn. What I think helps is that he has, he is a proven director, like he has directed. Yeah. He's past. more known as a director, I think, right now. Than yeah, director. so, uh, but I, I don't know, I feel, uh, I feel a jinx around that movie, especially with King Richard yeah. now in the play. It's like, that seems to be the heartwarming movie that's capturing a lot of people. So is there really room for two of those movies? We'll see. Uh, so, but yeah, I think Kenneth Branagh and Adam McKay, honestly, I think may be in competition for that fifth spot. And I think Spielberg, I might bump him up to four. I think, again, it's the most, within the Heights, really not in the contention and Dune being such a different blockbuster. I think this could be one, again, you just love it. People love West Side Story and they want to celebrate the movie um, and celebrate Steven Sondheim and celebrate Spielberg. You know, this is going to be one of his, unfortunately, you know, he's had a long career. This will be one of his yeah. last big movies. I think they may want to honor the greatest blockbuster director of all time, directing mm -hmm. a great hopefully, you know, a big moneymaker, especially in the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. So you, are you not considering Del Toro right now? I'm thinking of kicking him out for Spielberg just because it's such yeah, a mystery. I, we have to see it. I don't think anybody's seen it. Um, yeah. You know, but it, again, I, as I said before in other episodes, I feel like the reason that movie is getting the attention it, it is is because it's the follow-up to Del Toro's Best Picture winning film, The Shape of Water, that doesn't strike me as a really Oscar film, especially when no. there are, like Shape of Water was unique in that year. We had a lot of indies, a lot of smaller films like Lady Bird, Get Out, uh, I, Tanya, uh, Three Billboards. Like that was kind of the spectacle nominee. We have a lot of those this year. We have Dune, we have West Side Story. We have Being the Ricardos, which is going to be kind of like, you know, f the bells and whistles of Hollywood. So it doesn't stand out as much as I felt like it stood out against the 2017 crowd. So yeah. I don't think he'll get it. Yeah. I, I think I may kick him out for Spielberg. Yeah. But we'll have to see. But yeah, that's West Side Story. It's looking pretty good for its Oscar chances. Um, now there's an award ceremony that's happening at some point later today, I believe, the Gotham Awards. Um, so by the time this video releases, you will all have known who wins. But we thought, why not, you know, before, before it all happens, throw out what, who, who we think will win here. Um, uh, the Gotham Awards, obviously, for smaller, more indie films. Um, so kicking it off with the first category, we have Best Picture. The, op uh, the nominees are Green Knight, The Lost Daughter, Passing, Pig, and Test Pattern. In terms of who's going to win here, I think I would personally lean towards The Lost Daughter, um, with maybe yeah. Passing Surprising. Yeah, I'm I'm leaning Lost Daughter too. I think of the film of the films in that category, um, I would say it, it's it's the best one. Um, that and Pig, I thought were really really outstanding. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Lost Daughter. I think it. Uh, the other ones feel a little bit s too small. I feel like that may, Lost Daughter probably has the most heavy hitters. I think because it's Matthew Gyllenhaal, right, writer, director. Mm -hmm the cast so yeah but i mean never be surprised that gotham awards you know they're not gonna always go with the ones that you think they'll go for the other yeah. scene just because they're not part of the narrative yet i think a lot of times you get like group think when it comes to like a lot of the awards because it's just they're awarding the same things over and over again gotham awards don't have that thing because they're not you know they come out 
before award season arguably like starts in full force. So yeah. interesting. we'll see. Yeah. Um, now on to a category I don't really have any clue with because I haven't seen most of these movies. Um, so best documentary feature, we have Ascension, um, Faya Dai, sorry if I mispronounced that, uh, Flea, President, and Summer of Soul. Um, I'm between Flea and Summer of Soul. I think I'm thinking Flea, probably. What do you think? Um, yeah, I think Flea is really... Um, groundbreaking in terms of being in like I believe it's an animated documentary um yeah which uh there's been a couple of those but I think it's an emerging uh medium so that could benefit uh but I also think Summer of Soul was really wonderful and even though it did go out and play I think it did you know do some box office for a documentary amidst the pandemic you yeah. know I don't think that should stop it because I think I mean honestly I feel like that is the Oscar front runner um Summer of Soul. I feel like yeah. it's, it helps that, you know, Quest Love's behind it. They had a commercial during the last Oscars. So maybe just the notoriety of that helps it win here. Um, but the, again, the Gotham's are a very different beast than all these other award shows. So yeah. um, interest, it's, it, it's, it's an interesting race. Summer of Soul did just recently, I'm, I forget the name, it just won something recently. And there was some statistic behind what it won that like almost no documentary that has won that has ended up winning a uh, documentary at um, the actual Oscars. Uh, yeah. Well, that branch, that, that branch is just insane. <laughs> yeah. They always, they all need, we always know they'll surprise us. Um, oh God. <laughs> Never have to see. Thing. No, no. If Summer of Soul is the front runner, then you can probably bet on it not being nominated. Um, <laughs> so yeah. I never, I, if I made a documentary, I would never want to be the front runner ever. Well, do you ever want to be the front runner, period? It seems like a curse. No. I mean, yeah. the last front runner to win Best Picture, I think, I mean, Nomad Land technically. Nomad Land kind of was, yeah. Nomad Land, yeah, never mind. It was a year ago. <laughs> it wasn't even yeah. a year ago. It was different. It was the pandemic year. It was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now into Best International Feature, something I also don't have a ton of um, knowledge of. Uh, we have the nominees are Azor, Drive My Car, The Souvenir Part 2, Teton, What Do We See When We Look to the Sky or Look at the Sky, and The Worst Person in the World. Um, maybe Worst Person in the World? I haven't seen, seen Teton yet, and I want to see it. I would say Worst Person in the World, or maybe Drive My Car seems to have a lot of buzz, too. Teton is extraordinary but it's very different. I feel like it's yeah. going to be a love it or hate it type of movie among a lot of voters. I think that's what could hurt it. I really hope it gets in at the Oscars because I think it's really deserving. Um, but I think that's what could hurt its overall chances. It, it, it feels very love it or hate it. That is, and I've heard nothing but great things about the worst person in the world. I feel like that's probably an easier film to digest. Um, and, and I also, like Rom, I feel like, really well-made rom-coms don't happen a lot and i feel like this is an example of that if i am correct so again it might just be a movie that people just fall in love with i think that's always the tough thing about award season there may be a better film but it's not about what's most well loved it's about what's yeah. most well liked and a lot of times what's most well liked are the films that make you feel good you know your Belfasts, your king richards um so yeah i would probably say worst person in the world but look out for teton it's a really maybe yeah. it's one that can break through like a black swan did. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I'm between worst person in the world and drive my car. Maybe I'll just say drive my car to be interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so now the Breakthrough Director Award. We have um, a name I'm going to butcher. Uh, Shatara Michelle Ford for Test Pattern. Maggie Gyllenhaal for The Lost Daughter. Rebecca Hall for Passing. Edson Oda for Nine Days. Uh, and... Emma Seligman for Shiva Baby. Um, probably Maggie Gyllenhaal, right? I don't know. I, I don't know the Gotham's history with actors, famous actors turned directors. That's um, true. We could, I mean, I think what may hurt her is that Rebecca Hall, I feel like, is in a very similar place. And so I feel like if you have the mentality of wanting to honor that type of work, that could they split. They split, oh. yeah. Um, in my heart, it's at Sonoda. I love Nine Days. Yeah. I think it's a, and I feel like maybe the Gotham see this as an opportunity to honor that film in places that they know other organizations will not. 
So I would love him to get nominated, but I don't think the film was nominated for Best Picture, so maybe that could hurt it. There maybe isn't yeah, a lot of around. Um, but my heart, my heart says Nine Days. That was a wonderful film. I believe it is available as, uh, if you live in America for digital purchase and maybe beyond. So check out Nine Days. It's a really extraordinary film. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, that's right. They may split between Rebecca and Maggie Gyllenhaal. I really like what Rebecca Hall did in passing. Um, I guess, I guess I'll say uh, Emma Seligman for Sheba Baby. She's been surprised. Certainly possible. Um, okay, so now for best screenplay, uh, we have The Card Counter, we have El Planeta, we have The Green Knight, The Lost Daughter, Passing, and Red Rocket. Um, this actually, yeah, this could probably be where they honor um, Maggie Gyllenhaal. I think she could yeah. win this. I would say it's it's hers or Red Rocket because I think there's a lot of love for Sean Baker. Yeah, yeah that's um, true. And again, I, I can never, it's always a hard thing to differentiate, like, do they spread the wealth? So because Red Rocket isn't a picture or director, do they go for Red Rocket here? Or is the overwhelming love for Lost Daughter means that they're going to honor Maggie Gyllenhaal here? It's always a tough thing to, like, do you go with the single nominee because this is where all the attention can go? Or do you go with the multiple nominee because that's just how strong the film is? Um, yeah. It's tough, you know, because, I, I mean, we've seen in the past, you know, your American Hustles, your Irishmans, you know, they can be the most nominated movie of yeah. the night and go home with nothing too. That's another possible thing, especially because The Lost Daughter, I do think is a bit divisive in terms of it's, it, you know, how it depicts motherhood. I think it could yeah. turn people off. Um, doesn't seem to turn the Gotham people off though. So again, maybe Maggie does take this one. Yeah, yeah. I think I would lean towards her. Um, okay, then outstanding lead performance. They do not separate by gender here this year. Um, we have <laughs> Olivia Coleman for The Lost Daughter. We have Frankie Faison for The Killing of Kenneth Chamberlain, um, Michael Gray Eyes for Wild Indian, Brittany S. Hall for, S. Hall for Test Pattern, Oscar Isaac for The Card Counter, Taylor Page for Zola, Joaquin Phoenix for Come On, Come On, Simon Rex for Red Rocket, Lily Taylor for Paper Spiders, and Tessa Thompson for Passing. Um, How many nominees is that? Is that eight? That looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I believe 10. Oh, okay, so it's a 10. I just, side note, I think this is what the Academy should do, um, you know. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's, it's a tricky. tricky thing to do, because then if you don't separate it by gender, there's always the case where um, more men could get nominated than women. Yeah, I think what the Academy should do is the next couple of years, have people vote normally and keep that system, and then say, if you had to, who would be your five nominees if they were just maybe like all together or eight nominees? And then who would you pick? Who would you pick out of like between Walking Phoenix and Renee Zellweger? Who do you think was better? Or Francis McDormand and Anthony Hopkins? Just to yeah. see if there would be such a gender bias. Because I feel like a lot of times, like, I know this is not a comparable association, but when the MTV Movie Awards first did this, I think they were the first big organization to do uh, I think so. gender inclusive, uh, gender in, uh, inclusive categories. Uh, women won both. Emma Watson won for film and Millie Bobby Brown won for Stranger Things and television. So, you know, we'll see. Anyway, mm -hmm. I just like that Gotham is, is, yeah. is trying. Um, as far I'm as glad winner, someone's trying it out. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about a winner here? I mean, it's such a wide field. It is. There's a lot of stuff here. Um, I, Olivia Coleman is the only one I really see here potentially getting at the Oscars. So I think that may almost discount her from winning. I think they may want to go with someone I else. Thought, yeah. I would say Tessa Thompson or Simon Rex. I'm between those two. Yeah, it could go in a lot of different directions. I don't have a particular, you know, strong emotion for like yeah. where it's gonna go. Olivia Coleman was exceptional in The Lost Daughter. Um, yeah, it could go in a bunch of different directions. Uh, what was, was yeah. it? Joaquin Phoenix for Come On, Come On? He Is was there. Yeah, he was there. Maybe. Yeah. Possibly, yeah. yeah. I think he also thing, behind Olivia has the most Oscar buzz. Yeah, and I think the other thing too about, I feel like this is true about a lot of these smaller awards. If you get in, they really love you. It's not like you're yeah. going along for the ride. So maybe because, you know, Joaquin Phoenix is a popular name and this seems to be a, a smaller film, um, especially because it's so different from the last movie he did. So different, so more it, subtle. You know, range, you know, I could see it. Mike Mills is really respected among the indie crowd. So maybe Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. 
Yeah. Also, just on a side note, there are in this sense there's ten nominees. There are five men and five women. I don't know if that was intentional or um, just happenstance, but that mm-hmm. that is how it's split. Um, I'll say I really like Tessa Thompson in passing, so I'll say Tessa Thompson. She also just recently was on that round table, so maybe she'll gain some buzz. <laughs> um, okay. Now, outstanding supporting performance. We have Reed Burney, the only one to get in for mass, surprisingly enough. Uh, Jesse Buckley for The Lost Daughter, Coleman Domingo for Zola, Gabby Hoffman for Come On, Come On, Troy Kotzer for Coda, Marley Matlin for Coda, and Ruth Nega for Passing. Um, I think I would go Ruth Nega here, probably. I really Possible. liked her. Definitely. Um, I think the Coda actors will cancel each other out, unfortunately. Yeah. Both yeah. great. Um, Jesse Buckley, do again, if they she really could. love Lost Daughter, she is incredible in this film, and I think she could go along for the ride. That's a very tough category. That's a stack. It is. And they, they went with the least um, buzzed about mass actor, too. That was surprising. You know, but I, yeah. I think we see that a lot of times that, you know, Oscars will go for showy, and not to discount, you know, I feel like a hand yeah. out, as we're talking about in Martha Plimpton, you know, they were extraordinary performances, but I feel like Reed Burney had to, I feel like he was the anchor to the, that ensemble. And I think the Gothams were ref, were acknowledging that. It is surprising though, that he's the only one, like you nominate both CODAs yet only one yeah. of the four masses. But I also think putting them all in supporting, I think is, is a death nail because you're not gonna get all four anywhere no. in. You know, I think they needed to put like, I think that what they should have done is Isaacs is lead, Plimpton is lead, and then the other couple is supporting, honestly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just like Mahershala Ali. The movie's kind of dead anyways, yeah, yeah, sadly. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's not, it's it's not the type of movie that people are going to want to rewatch and, like, tell people to watch because it's just, it's, it's so, it's so visceral. And so I think that really hurts people getting into the movie. It kind of reminds me of um, how clemency with Alfre Woodard really didn't get anywhere that season because it just it's so disheartening and heartbreaking, and you just don't. It's not the type of movie that you're going to leave and be like, "Man, you got to see this movie." Yeah, um, yeah. You know, unless you like hate the person because it's you're subjecting yeah. them to something horrible. I I like you know, movies that good. make me feel terrible, so that's just me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and what I like to do to myself. Uh, but what was I going to say? Also, Bleecker Street is just butchering the whole um, campaign. I think so much of it, sadly, is about campaigning. If the right studio was behind this, I think it would be doing much better. Yeah, it's. It, I can't remember. Like, I can't remember if they've ever been able to really get a major player. And I feel like you know, Neon came around not so long ago, and they've already had a Best Picture winner with yeah. Parasite. So it's not just because they're new. A24, Plan B, you know, there's a lot of these indie studios. They've, Amazon, Netflix, you know, even yeah. the bigger ones, they've been yeah. able to launch into this game. So I think Bleaker still needs to find a path forward and support yeah. their nominees. They've only gotten two nominations before. Um, Vico Mortensen for Captain Fantastic and Brian Cranston for Trumbo. Um, so okay. good that they, they pulled both of, both of those off, but and those aren't like... Those are competitive years, too, for Best Actor. They At were, least, yeah. 2015 definitely was. Um, definitely. So, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I still need to see Mass, Bleecker Street, no example, <laughs> until like January. Um, <laughs> but yeah. 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 Anyways, I'd say Ruth Nega here. Yeah, um, sure. And then Breakthrough Performer, Amelia Jones for CODA, um, Natalie Morales for Language Lessons, Rachel Sennett for Shiva Baby, uh, Susanna Sun for Red Rocket, and Amelia Ullman for El Planeta. Um, the kid from Come On, Come On was not on that list? I know, seriously. What do you know? Wow, okay. He, yeah. um, Them and their child actors, poor kid actors, never get enough credit. Oh my God, Jacob Tremblay robbed yeah. that year. Yeah. Um, I would probably say, I mean, Amelia Jones, I think, has gotten the most press um, for CODA. So yeah. maybe her. I mean, she's fantastic in the movie. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably where I'd lean. Also, the fact that three of the actors from CODA, and it was yeah. all the three that, they were the three to get in, and the fact that they all got yeah. in, there is support for the acting ensemble of CODA. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she sings, and she's heartfelt, and she, you know, technically... She does a lot. She, she learned... Lot. Te- uh, she learned uh, sign language and she learned how to sing for the movie too. Apparently yeah. she hadn't sung before. And she's she funny, but she's also dramatic and she has to, you know, she has to 
She's the, the anchor, yeah. She's the anchor. She is both, you know, she's technically doing a dual language performance. Not yeah. technically, she is doing a dual language performance. Yeah, um, yeah I would, I, I think that's the one that people out of the category are the most, you know, impressed by. Yeah, yeah, I'd go with her too. Um, and then that's pretty much it. There's a few other ones, but those don't really, those are um, more TV and so related. Um, but yeah. So you'll let uh, us know if we were yeah. right, because you yeah, are in a few hours. Balls. You'll have to see how, how correct we were. Um, we'll have, to, yeah, really that's kind of like the first, the first test of how we're doing prediction wise. <sighs> don't um, judge us on this. Cool. At least don't yeah. judge me on this. Thing. Don't judge us on this. Awards are not our problems. strong suit. Yeah. That's not, that's not, yeah, that's definitely not the place to judge us. The Gotham Awards are a completely different beast than um, the Oscars. Um, okay. So then uh, I know that the Critics' Choice film nominations um, will be coming out before our next episode, but that's probably going to take way too long predict, to predict. Um, but we'll cover them when they come out next week and maybe do some predictions then. Um, do we? I have a question for you, Jack. Do yeah. you think this will, that the Critics' Choice are going to become the new Golden Globes? Um, I don't think so. I think the Golden Globes are going to survive, sadly. Okay. I think, I think people, there's just something like, even now, I, I forget where, but like when people talk about awards, um, it was on some sort of um, podcast and they're the, um, like movie reviewer people who don't really care about awards. They still talk about like Oscars and Golden Globes and nothing else. Yeah. Um, I just feel like there's, there's so much um weight around that title. I, I think the critics choice will rise in status. But I also think they're, um, they also aren't completely um, trustworthy in the way they do things because they, I, I just don't like how they do like eight nominees for the acting. It's like, that's not even like committing to anything. That's like hedging your bets and such. Um, I think they'll gain um, more relevancy, but I don't think they'll reach that I level. Mean, what I like about the Critics' Choice is that you kind of have the assurance that they've seen the movies because it's their job yeah. to see the movies. And I yeah. like that if they were the bellwether, if they were going to be the start of award season as we know it, and that is the trajectory, like the same way we talk about Golden Globes creating a narrative, I would like it if it was created by a group who have definitely seen the movies and are yeah. not just awarding things to get people to their hotel. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm interested to see how this season is different because of the Critics' Choice. Because I feel yeah. like... And imagine, the Golden Globes. Imagine the 2019 ceremony year, the season, where Glenn Close and Bohemian Rhapsody beat A Star Is Born. And then that put yeah. them on a trajectory that even though Glenn Close didn't win, it was this shocking. Like that was the narrative. Didn't Glenn Close and Lady Gaga tie? At the Critics' Choice. So I think yeah. that would They do ties too. They do tie, like which that. is interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. But hey, I'll take a tie and yeah. eight nominees over all the craziness of the hfpa um, yeah yeah I, i'm interested yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm i would definitely it. prefer them over the golden globes because yeah. they are much more credible i just don't I think the golden globes would want happen. the critics choice over the golden globes yeah at this yeah. Point. yeah we'll have to see how those go those i think they're still doing winners and nominees and such i just don't think they're doing a actual ceremony this year uh we'll have to see um what people who win and get nominated and such react to such a thing if they still take it for their buzz. I don't think they react. I think some morals. They ignore it. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Oh well. Yeah. So that's that's all that's all for news. Um now we're heading into reviews. So speaking of House of Gucci, um, you know, heading right into it. Um, you know, uh, where do we start with this movie? Um I did I remember, let me pull it up, right when, when I left the movie, there was a quote in particular that I think, um, within the movie, that I think helped describe the movie. Um, and it was, never confuse shit with chocolate. Um, you know, with this movie, I think there's a balance when a film is trying to pull off camp. Um, there's a line between intentionally campy and um, like unintentionally bad. I think this movie blurs that line a lot. I think Ridley Scott, when he was making this movie, I don't think he really wanted to make it campy, but I think parts of it are campy. I don't think he wanted and, to make the movie. <laughs> yeah, Period. true. True. I think I think it should have embraced the campiness, um, but I don't. It didn't embrace it enough in certain places. It did, and those places just kind of felt out of place. Um, but I think if they embraced it, it would have made the movie less of a um, like long, boring stretch in certain moments. Um, 
you know, all, all of it, like all of its ambitions are cut, um, cut down by like how inconsistent the entire cast is. Gaga is good. Leto is totally wherever, whatever, wherever he's doing. He is not in the same movie as everyone else. Um, Driver's fine. Um, Pacino, I thought was pretty, pretty good. Um, everyone else, um, fine, but they feel like they all have, it's like, um, it's like, I saw someone tweet this. It's like when your teacher gives you a group project and the teacher is not very clear on what the guidelines are for the project. So everyone just does like whatever they think should be done. And it's just like this messy thing that that's what this movie is like. Um, yeah. And all of that Ridley Scott in that situation would be the teacher. Um, and it would be his fault that he did not give off better guidelines or in this case direction. It's his job to make sure all of these performances are in the same movie and in the same tone. He didn't do that. Um, it's also aesthetically not very pleasing. The cinematography I thought I found was kind of ugly. Um, not not of it was fo- none of it was really focused on the actual Gucci like what it is. Like there's very little fashion um, f- from what I would ex- expect from a Gucci movie. Um, but yeah, overall, I think it was boring, plotting, kind of a drag, um, with some good performances, mostly Gaga. Leto was really bad, but I think he's going to get nominated. But okay, what, what did you think? So, all right, this is where I was on Saturday when I went to go see House of Gucci. Uh, I was traveling home from the Thanksgiving holiday. It was a two-hour plane ride, so it wasn't that draining. Yeah. Um, I went to the Sing 2 pre-screening at oh, 5, cool. and then I went to House of Gucci at 7. And yeah. did you fall asleep? I fell asleep. Oh, you did. Okay, yeah. And Makes sense. Then what happened? I felt, you know, I am the type of person that even though, like, for example, I knew Dear Evan Hansen was going to be terrible, I like to see the movie before yeah. I can critique it. Again, unless it's spewing hate speech or of, yeah. <laughs> of the like. So I watched House of Gucci again on Sunday morning. You did it twice. Ugh. And I realized. What I thought I was asleep for an hour, I fell asleep for 15 minutes. But if oh, I yeah. felt that's how much this movie is a mess and that I thought I missed so much because the movie is just so hollow. It has nothing to say and has no idea how to say it effectively. I was searching for meaning anywhere in the movie. It very much feels as if the Wikipedia page of this event is being read by the Italian on a pizza box. That's just what the movie feels like. Cause yeah. it doesn't feel like a script. It doesn't feel like it has no pathos. There's no emotional arc. It doesn't have any character arcs period. It just feels like you're reading a list of facts. It kind of feels like how a lot of these biopics as this one does will have those, you know, little sentences at the end. That's what the whole yeah. movie felt like. It was just sentences yeah. about this that had no it was in every scene was inconsequential from the next there was no through line there was no protagonist because you can't tell me that patrizia reggiani is the protagonist when she disappears in the third act yeah those mind-boggling choices i've seen in a movie recently i just no enthusiasm for ridley scott when i was asleep in the theater i felt that i had a better understanding of him because i felt like he was asleep while making this movie um lady gaga was fine the movie doesn't deserve her she's giving this no way more i felt the same way about her that i did about julianne moore in dear evan hansen the movie does not deserve the work that she's putting in um leto was fine pacino was fine driver really out of everybody i think driver should be the most embarrassed because a lot of the movie is on his shoulders especially in the third act and the fact that it doesn't work especially when gaga goes away i think this may be driver's worst performance that i've seen uh which probably yeah, it's, it's not a lot of great work. It's a, you know, it's not like it's the worst of many uh, bad performances. But I, I was really surprised with his work. Jeremy Irons was in two scenes. I thought maybe he was the best part, um, but that's probably because he was only in two scenes. Um, yeah, yeah just none of it worked. None of it clicked. I felt like I don't know what the point of the story was. I I thought it was so shoddily made, as you said. It didn't look. Cinematography wasn't no. good. The editing wasn't good. The screenplay was very flawed. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, yeah, just nothing, nothing worked. And again, I feel like in a world where like Ryan Murphy exists, like, like yeah. the assassination Gianni Versace was a well-regarded television season. How is that not your 
like backbone. Like I don't understand. Like Ryan Murphy should have been the one to make this. Yeah. Um, I think because he, I think, understands. I feel like him and then James Wan with Malignant understands how to use camp, but not have it lessen the drama. You know, we talk about this a lot of time with Marvel movies is when the comedy kind of takes away from the yeah. dramatic beats. Murphy and Wan, I think, understand how camp can help effectively support the dramatic arcs. I mean, there were no dramatic arcs for the camp to support here. That's no. the other thing. Yeah, really, really misfire. Yet, I have no idea if it's going to get nominated for Best Picture. Yeah. That's just yeah. how it is. There are so many of these crowd pleasers this year, I think because the pandemic pushed them all. And I don't know. Like, I currently don't have Gucci for no. anything. I kicked it out a makeup. while ago. But I don't have Gaga. I don't have Leto. Nope. But oh, again, I, in the real world, I can still see them win. It's weird. I could, I, I both, I don't have them in there, and then I could see them walking away with an Oscar. Yeah. That's how yeah. crazy this movie is. I honestly don't know how it's going to play. Yeah, I haven't, I don't think I ever really, besides like in May, had Gucci in my top 10 for a picture. Um, I did kick Gaga out, even though sadly she is really the only redeemable part of the movie. I do think Pacino is also pretty good, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, the only stuff I really have right now, I, I, I would see it having Oscar Wise, a um, hillbilly elegy kind of route where it gets makeup and yeah. then it gets the wacky performance, which would, I liked actually Glenn Close and hillbilly elegy, but would be Jared Leto here. I felt bad for it. See, that's, that's the, the House of Gucci didn't make me feel bad. I felt a little bad for the Gaga, not as bad as I felt for Glenn Close and Amy Adams. So yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like maybe with Glenn Close, there was a pity vote. I think that's why she got in, that people felt so bad for her post Olivia Coleman, and this was a follow up. They just felt bad for her. Um, I think she was really good in it, too, if they saw it. She was good. She was good. Um, I would say she probably was the best part of the movie, which isn't yeah. saying much. Which is the opposite here. Jared Leto is the worst part, in my opinion. Jared Leto is the most love it or hate it. And I think what hurts him is. I don't know. It's just, it's, it, he sticks out like a sore thumb. He uh, does. That could so, be good in some cases. It if, could be. It didn't help him with the little things. He, well, he, um, he was probably the number six that year. He got nominated for a Globe. I guarantee you he was probably, I would get, I think he was the seven. I think because Lakeith gets in there, I think Chadwick for Defy Bloods would have been six. And then True. he would have been yeah. seven. Um, he, Maybe. And that's a few people benefit from a box office success. Lady Gaga really yeah. brought in the people this weekend. I think it's 20 million plus. It made way more than the last duel did in its so entire sad. run, which is that insane. Still is good. So that, again, box office could help it. Being a box office success in 2021 means a lot this year. That's why I think West Side Story is going yeah. to be very well. I unless think it's in the Heights and I I would disagree with that. I don't think it means much because I think King Richard just flopped and I don't think that had any impact on its chances. I don't, I don't think it means that you, like if you don't make money, you're dead in the water. But I do think the fact that, I think this is an issue with Netflix and a lot of the streamers is that they don't play in theaters. There isn't a groundswell of support. There's, it's not the same word of mouth that gets spread. You know, there's an energy when you see a movie in theaters. I think this is why Being the Ricardos is doing so well because when people go sit down and watch this in the press screenings, they're just having such a great communal experience with the film. You can't get that if you if you're not if you don't play well. I mean, look at I mean, I didn't like the last duel, but a lot of people did. The fact that that didn't perform, gone. Jody Comer, gone. And the Heights, gone. Um, you, I think you box office does do something. I mean, that's why Bohemian Rhapsody got in. That's why Black Panther got in. That's why a lot of these Joker got in. You know, box office I do think matters because it shows. It says, look at me. I'm doing something right, I think, in some ways, especially for these award contenders. Yeah, yeah, I do think it does matter, um, especially for theatrical films. I, I just feel like it's unfair for like the theatrical films to have that burden on them and then for the Netflix films to just not have to deal with that and it doesn't impact them at all. Yeah, um, well, Netflix doesn't make these type of movies. I think that's the key. They're not making crowd pleasers. They're making the, they're, like, the passion projects from these wonderful filmmakers. Yeah. Like they're yeah. not putting up Eurovision for Oscars outside of song. No, no. You know, they're not they're not making green books. They're making Romas, Irishmen, Power of the Dogs, Marriage Stories, you know. I, like look at someone like Dolmite. 
that was one. If it played in theaters, it could have gotten Eddie Murphy a nomination because Netflix, it was the Netflix model, didn't play. I think box office does have an impact on getting people's attention when you have award voters who have to see so many movies in such a short period of time. If you're a box office hit, you may get the attention from just being in the news. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but so Austin, what do you have um, nomination wise? Just makeup. Makeup costume. I mean, if the Gucci movie doesn't get nominated for costumes, I don't think it's going to. I don't think the costumes were that good. Yeah, but I, you know, I didn't think Rocket Man or Dolmite would miss out, and Downton Abbey would miss out on costumes, but they all did, and Joker and Irishman got in. So yeah, you know, yeah. We'll I see. think these were big overall contenders, though. I don't think this is. Yeah, I think again, I can see it. Contenders do have good costumes, like West Side Story, like Dune. I think would say Licorice Pizza honestly probably has a better shot than this for costumes. I think as far as costumes go, I think Cruella is the front runner um, to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll see, we'll see. I makeup definitely, but I, I it's between that and the odds of Tammy Faye. I feel like for that category, um, depends yeah. on what gets more scene. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, if they just show the scene, the final scene of that movie of Tammy Faye. And then, you know, people know who Jessica Chastain is. I think you're fine. Yeah. I think that's the thing. I think in the end, as much as I don't think Jessica Chastain isn't getting nominated for Best Actress, I think they know of her and they know, like, that's all that matters is that they know her and that, that makeup is so effectively done. The thing, and that they like her. Jared Leto yeah. is a divisive performance and that's the makeup that you're going to be awarding if you give it that Oscar. So... Um, I think that's another thing too. It's, it's it's a very strange movie. I can't remember another movie. It is very strange. Movie, which, it is. You know, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. So that's House of Gucci. You know, I wouldn't go see it, um, especially if it's only in theaters. Maybe wait until a lot it's more to say. Do not waste yeah. your time. Somebody who's wasted five hours of their life with this yeah. movie, do not. Don't do it. I love Lady Gaga. You, it'll be a testament to her. If you don't waste time with this. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully she, I mean, on paper, this looks like a really good next movie to do, but hopefully she, her next role, whatever it is. Um, is she, a little could bit still get in. she could still get in. I mean, she's still know, like probably my number seven or something. Crazier things have happened. She's my six. So, you know, yeah, what can happen? Definitely could still happen. Okay. So then the other, um, big movie we're going to review here coming out on Netflix in like four days uh, The Power of the Dog um, I saw this a while back I saw this in like September um, so I'm going to have to refresh my mind a little bit throughout this but I really enjoyed it um, overall I did see it like um, I saw it once and I saw it like again like a week after and I liked it even more the second time um, the first time I did like it overall I found certain parts in, in the pacing to be a little slow but then the second time I found that um, pacing to be a little more purposeful for the movie. Um, but yeah, overall, um, I really enjoyed this. I like the way it explores, especially in this time, um, masculinity and the different types of masculinity. And um, yeah, just especially, I don't, I don't want to spoil certain stuff. There's, it's weird stuff. Um, there's something that happens that um, in the second half of the film that, uh, I wouldn't want to spoil relationship wise because that um, surprised me a little bit, but I liked where it went. Um, but yeah, the, the um, artist or the artistry and the talent here from Campion really on display, especially the cinematography is like really, really good. Um, the writing is good. The performances, I think this is Benedict's best performance. Um, yeah. It's really, really good. And um Kirsten is also really good. I don't know if it's probably not her best performance, but I would say nomination worthy. And yeah, Cody Smith McVie, who I don't think some people think he'll get nominated. Um, I think it's too subtle, um, but I think he, he does a really good job. And those would be the main three. Um, but yeah, what do you think of this movie? Uh, just to speak to Cody, which uh, we'll get into with Best Supporting Actor, it, you know, I, I call it the Marina nom. You know, if they love you, they really love yeah. you. If they love yeah. Power of the Dog, like Marina Dick Tafira and Roma, he could go along for the ride. I think the other two are definitely in, and in a perfect world, yeah. Benedict and Kirsten would win hands down. I currently think Kirsten will win, um, yeah. but I, 
my favorite movie of the year. And I honestly wow, think it'll nice. be hard for something to exceed it. Um, I love this movie. I thought it was brilliant. I thought that what Campion was doing by deconstructing the Western and specifically exploring, as you said, the masculine facade that a lot of classic Westerns have, I thought was groundbreaking. I found it to be as an effective a deconstruction of the genre that La La Land was to the musical. And I thought it was just absolutely brilliant. It is, it's, I think Benedict Cumberbatch, his performance, I would say is on par with Heath Ledger's and Brokeback Mountain, as far as an affecting performance that really seeps into you. And by the end of the movie, you are just blown away. I didn't, I, I love Benedict Cumberbatch. I love yeah. Sherlock is one of my favorite shows. It inspired me. I made my own Sherlock films growing up with my cousin. I loved him. I didn't know he had this in him. He is so good in this movie. He's really um, good. Fantastic. Jesse Plemons also, I, I really Smaller like role. Smaller yeah. role. And I like the choice that they do because there's a moment when Kirsten Dunst, I won't say specifically, but has to do something that Plemons wants her to do and she doesn't really do it. And then he kind of fades oh, away yeah. because yeah. he loses interest in her. And I thought that was such a smart choice on Campion. And that's the other thing. Campion really trusts her audience here. And there's a Very lot of subtleties. So. Yes. And a lot of subtleties and nuances that she's playing that are just just beautifully done, perfectly done. It's a sweeping film. It's, it's, it's lush. It's beautiful. It's heartbreaking. It's horrifying. I mean, there are some moments, I both thought Benedict Cumberbatch was the best villain of the year, and yet one of the most emotionally wrecking, empathetic characters that I've seen yeah. in years. The fact that he could do both and the movie can do both is a testament to what this movie's ambition is and what it accomplishes. I was floored by the movie. I thought it was brilliant. I can't wait to see it again. I did get yeah. to see it in theaters. I, if you can, try yeah. to find a theater to play it. Don't it. Um, I feel like with the pacing, people are just going to be so inclined to pull out their phones. And this is a movie you have to like keep very like close attention to it. Or you're going to miss a lot of um, really good decisions and important decisions. Yeah. The movie. Especially because I think what's really great about the film is that the the first half is kind of focused on Kirsten Dunst's experiences within this yeah. narrative. And I, what I love about that is it's so smart because I feel like in terms of film language, we've grown accustomed to seeing women be thrusted into society and to experiences where they're uncomfortable and that they're not their yeah. true selves. Um, not to say that it's not, you know, a story worth telling, it definitely is. But Campion uses that so you have a, wor a cinematic word box, if you will, for the second half of the movie. And yeah. the feeling, I, I, described, I described the film as it explores the vices we live through that turn into the boxes that constrain us. And yeah. everything yeah. about it is just, it's surprising, it's shocking, but I, it has every positive adjective I could say about this movie, I yeah. wanna say about it. I haven't seen a movie that really surprised me. Because I honestly, if you ask them what my least favorite genre is, it's probably Westerns, because I find them so emotionally cold a lot of the times. This movie, this may be my favorite Western I've ever seen. That's how great this movie is. Yeah. I really, really, really loved it. And I hope, I mean, for me, it's personally, if I was an Oscar voter, it would get picture, director, actor, supporting actress, score, Johnny Greenwood, two for two this really year. Really good. My God. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, so, I hope this is another year like Alexander Desplat in 2015 who was nominated for Imitation Game and it's also been to come about and Budapest yeah. and other Budapest. I hope that he gets nominated for at least one and wins off of the yeah. stream. I would I like his Spencer score a little more, but I want him to be nominated for both. Both are great, really very different too. I think he's a very really different the emerging cinematic composer that we should pay attention to. But the cinematography, yeah. the production so design, the editing, every again, every visual every aesthetic component of a film is working on such a different level than most films being made today that I'm really fortunate. And I really love that, you know, we talk about, you know, this will be on Netflix, whether people will give it a try. The fact that this is a movie that's available everywhere. I love that. I think that's yeah. what I really love about Netflix is that these indie movies don't just play on the coast. Anybody can watch the new Jane Campion movie. Anybody can watch a, the new Noah Baumbach, the new 
Alfonso Coron. That's what I love about what Netflix is doing and why I think we should celebrate them because I think they are getting audiences to check out indie movies in ways that they may have not before. Um, so I have, I really have high hopes for this movie's awards season chances. I hope Netflix really gets behind it. Um, uh, yeah, best movie of the year for me. And I don't think it'll be topped, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah. I forget where I had it ranked. It's in my, t- it's definitely my top 10, maybe my top five. Um, mm-hmm. I, I did really enjoy it. Like you said, the, cinema, the cinematography in particular um, really stood out to me. There are, there are certain such shots that are just going to forever be in my mind when I think of this movie. Um, yeah. Awards-wise, I think it'll get into picture. I don't think it'll win because I think it's probably a little too artsy for that. Um, then director, yeah, Campion. This is um, a, a director who deserves to get in, unlike I think, because you can tell that there's decisions being made. There's a certain vision. Um, I feel like movies like Belfast um, probably lack a little more of that than um, this movie per se does. Um, Do you then, have her as your front runner? To win? I have her as my number two to win. I still have, I still have Denis winning. Um, okay. Not completely confident in that. <laughs> yeah. I just think it's such a technical achievement. I mean, but this is a technical achievement too um, in a lot of ways, but I think Dune in particular is a huge technical achievement. And then... Um, okay. That's actor, obviously, and supporting actress would get in. Mm-hmm. Do you who do you have winning supporting actress, um, if not Dunst? Or do um, have- I think I do have Dunst still. I've I've had her since I saw the movie. Um, I'm not completely sure if if she would still win. Um, it's her and Balf, I think. It's between her and Balf. Um, maybe maybe. Um, to Alice. But that's a, I, think, I think she stays in that number three position. I can't see her yeah. driving above, unless King Richard is just like the new hot thing. Which yeah, I would say it's between Balf and um, Dunst. Uh, I, I think it would have to do with how both of their movies um, endure the rest of the season, campaign wise. I would probably guess the Power of the Dog has more momentum, personally, because I think it's a better movie. But I think it has it's more- coming out later. More coming out later has more, I think, to say, and I, I also don't think it hurts that the two stars of Power of the Dog will be in the highest grossing movie of all time. Wink, wink. True, uh, true. Or in highest grossing movie of 2021. We'll see if it's all time. Oh, um, yeah. After, after last night's like, ticket sales, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, um, but I think that could help her because she'll get, I mean, she's, especially because, just side note, once we see the movie No Way Home and they reveal what we all assume that Dunst, McGuire, Stone, and Garfield are in the movie. I don't think Dunst is going to be in the movie, honestly. I, I mean, I've heard talks that she's in the movie. So if she is, and then they do like the interview circuit where they reunite everybody for like Kimmel or something after the movie, I mean, that could help her because then she's yeah. getting more attention. So we'll have to see if she's even in the movie. I think she is. I, I can't imagine that she, they leave her behind um, if they reunite the other three and then stone as spider gwen so we'll see um yeah. but i think it helps that she, even without it benedict cumberbatch at least will be in no way home and that will bring again more attention to power of the dog the same way that Mary's having a year yeah a he's having a great year um see the mauritanian if you missed that that was a really great movie which yeah Bach, he also had um what was it the L- the electric life of louis wayne and yeah the electric life of louis wayne great year um yeah. but i think yeah i think the same way that it helped that's Adam Driver was in Star Wars 9 around the same time that Marriage Story was coming out. I think the fact that No Way Home is coming out with possible one or two other actors in Power of the Dog, I think will help people be like, I just saw him in No Way Home. Yeah, let's try Power of the Dog. Yeah, yeah. I do think it could help him um, in particular because I think he he's being marketed a lot surrounding the movie too. He's like a, yeah. uh, the second biggest person in it, it seems like. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... All that, and then all the techs, I think it'll get plenty of tech nominations. Yeah. Um, and all that. Yeah. So overall, I forgot to give House of Gucci a rating, um, like a three out of 10, maybe a four. I agree, um, a three out of 10. Yeah, three and a half to be nice. Um, this nine, probably, eight and a half or nine is where I would lean. How about you? I'd go 10. I'm, um, 10 out of 10. It's brilliant. It's high praise. I praise. <laughs> I've only had two of those this year. Um, Uncertain yeah. Dune? 
That's it. Correct. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> you do. I'm too predictable. Um, I think I think I gave I on my letterbox. I think I gave five movies five out of five stars. Um, yeah. I'm trying to remember. I oh, think yeah. it was Power of the Dog, Nine Days, um, Tick Tick Boom. Um, I was four, Spencer and Black Widow. Black, Black Widow was my dude. You really liked Black Widow. <laughs> oh my God. Black Widow's my favorite MCU character. So I've, oh, I've been waiting yeah. forever for that yeah. movie. Again, it was my, my dude, what I've been waiting yep. for for a decade. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, so those are um, the main two reviews this week. Um, I know you saw a few other films, Anthony, you may want to give quick thoughts on right here. Yeah, I saw King Richard um, last week. I saw it in theaters. Um, I was one of the few. Yeah, Um, seriously. I saw it on HBO Max. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Listen, this movie is getting a lot of praise. Um, It's definitely a feel-good movie. I I, I wanted to say, I didn't have... it's The flaws I have with the movie are not Green Book flaws. They're not... I don't think the movie is touting a racist message because i feel like these type of movies yeah. could do that like it, the hidden figures the helps you know you're always like is there a some sort of racial undertones in the story um and i, I think don't, this movie is kind of clear about the racial undertones yeah it's my flaws are not with that it's definitely more in line with hidden figures than green book um yeah. that being said i just particularly didn't care for the film i thought that its focus on will smith deprive the movie a lot of pathos because I truly don't know who Venus and Serena were outside of the ring, uh, ring, the, the, what do you call it? Court. Court, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Tell I'm not a sports buff. <laughs> a ring. Um, but yeah, I just, I didn't really get to know them. And I felt like, you know, there were a lot of things that the movie explores, like how do, how does Venus feel that her father kept Serena behind because he felt that she had the better chance of being a bigger star. And I would love to know how that felt. The movie's not interested in that. It's only interested in praising this guy and, and the stats of how the tennis matches. I don't really, there's one scene with Anjanu Ellis that I really feel like gets to the heart of the people behind these matches. Yeah. Um, and that's the strongest scene in the movie because of that. But the, again, it's two and a half hours. It feels it. It's a lot of tennis with not, I feel, you know, the best sports movies are the ones that really focus on the people. And I felt this movie focused more on the game. Uh, Will Smith is yeah. fine. He's not doing anything that particularly surprised me. I don't think he's doing anything of real note. I think if he gets in and wins, it's because they love Will Smith and they feel that he's deserving and he's been... Uh, forgotten in the past because honestly I, I think Benedict Cumberbatch and Andrew Garfield are giving much more dynamic performances than Smith it's just that they just like him and it's a feel-good movie so yeah. they feel good about it but yeah it's this this I would put this in the same category as Belfast as a movie that I don't think challenges uh, the medium it doesn't accurately I think portray the characters lives and is really more interested in being you know, warm and fuzzy. And because of that, it comes off as a little saccharine. It just, it feels like a Hallmark card. It's devoid of any true substance. It's, um, it's kind of like if Disney were to get into the biopic making business. Yeah. But even then, like Saving Mr. Banks, which is a Disney biopic, I, I really like that movie because I think Emma Thompson yeah. and Tom Hanks have a really interesting dynamic and it's powered by their emotional arcs. So even a Disney biopic, focuses more on character than this one does this one just felt like it kind of looked we just i described house of gucci as like a wikipedia script this kind of felt the same way it's like you were given a list of all of the games that venus played and it was just about getting from bullet point to bullet point without real thought about why the characters went from bullet point to bullet point yeah Um, yeah i did feel why I did feel some of an arc with um, Venus in particular. I don't think um, Richard has much of an arc because I don't think he really changes much as a person. No. Um, I did he like call on it and he doesn't change. That's another thing. Yeah, yeah. The speech, it's like it's calling on him to go in an arc and he doesn't change. He, I think he, in moments he he does better than he did before after that moment. I think he has a realization, and especially towards the end, I think he's there more um, in more supportive ways for his kids, but. He, he yeah he he doesn't change it. the speech at the end where he's like you should be proud of yourself and I'm like yeah I, again I don't know this some of it just 
it felt very generic. It felt like the, uh, this felt like the average biopic Hollywood is so comfortable making. And when we have yeah. movies like Spencer, which we both love. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, I think we had a question from Constance, I believe in our Q and a section a couple of weeks ago, like what makes yeah. a great biopic. This didn't really have any of that. It was an expansive no. life and it focused on an event and then worked from there. It didn't feel like it had a director's vision. I never at one point felt I, a camera choice. I felt some moments there were some vision from Ronaldo Marcus Green. I, I think it's better than your typical biopic direction, um, especially certain shots like when he was on the ground and the tennis balls were rolling by him. I thought there were certain moments where I felt like, okay, there's a, some artistry, uh, artistry behind this. Yeah, it's not, I, I, I would say that I liked Belfast, le, like, the, I like this more than Belfast, so this isn't, like, yeah. this won't be my least favorite Best Picture nominee if it gets in. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I still think there are some more, like, I would definitely prefer Spencer to get in. If we're good, oh, if we're, yeah. one biopic has yeah. to get in, but my lord, put in Spencer. Especially when we have, like, House of Gucci and King Richard and Spencer. The fact that Spencer is the least likely to get nominated it's is both sad. Um, Very sad. So yeah, I I would give this probably like a th- uh, like a six out of ten, maybe a five point five. Um, yeah. I'm still deciding. You know, I'll probably have to watch Somewhere it again in there. before yeah. March. So we'll yeah, see. it's another longer one. Yeah, I thought it was paced pretty well though. Unlike Gucci. Oh my God, Gucci! <laughs> yeah. Anything is paced better than Gucci. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's just yeah, very very bad. Um. And then, did you want to talk about Encanto, or do we do we want to save that for the best animated part? Um, I thought Encanto was a lot of fun. I thought it was a really uh, great Disney animated film. It grew on me as I thought more about it. I thought, even though I don't think it will get Lynn the EGOT, I thought the songs were a lot of fun. Uh, we don't talk about Bruno. I'm singing it all over my head. It preserved my sanity last night while I was waiting for Spider-Man tickets. So listening oh, to the Encanto song. I love about those. Um, uh, you haven't got your tickets? No, I don't ever need to get tickets for where I live. Force Awakens, oh, yeah. I, I just walked in and there was like like half full. So yeah, I was. It took perks me of living in nowhere. Took me three and a half hours, so it was. That I got my tickets. It was crazy. I didn't. I don't feel like I waited that long for Endgame, but who knows? Maybe I did. Um, but yeah, I thought it was a lot of fun. Very colorful, eye popping. I like the theme. As so many films, especially children's movies, I feel like have this theme of be be independent, be yourself. Um, but I think this movie is like, yeah, but you want to be yourself so you can be part of a greater whole. And I like the message of that. Uh, Stephanie yeah. Beatriz's voice work as Mirabelle, the lead character, I thought was really strong. Um, so yeah, I really, I, and it was very surprising. I never knew where the movie was going, which was so refreshing, especially for a Disney movie. So I think it's the best animated feature for a runner. Uh, maybe, you know, we always look at like movies like Anomalisa and Flea this year. Maybe yeah. they can pull off an upset. But I think it's going to be in Kanto, and I think it'll be deserving. It's a really strong movie. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, onto category spotlight. We're going to be talking about best animated feature um, because Encanto just came out. Um, yeah, I um, I currently don't have it as my number one to win. I would still have Luca probably in the number one spot. Um, but then also behind it, I would have Mitchells versus the Machines. I would have Encanto. Um, I would have uh, what's called Flea, and I would have Bell. Um, get again. Those would be my five. My five would be Encanto winning, followed by Flea, followed by Luca, followed by Mitchell's versus Machines, followed by Ryan the Last Dragon. Yeah, three. You think three of the Disney slash Pixar ones are gonna get in? Yeah, because people. That's what they see. It's you know. I mean, granted, yeah. sometimes I feel like in terms of the nominations, sometimes they don't all get in. Usually, they the Disney one wins because that's what everybody sees because it's the whole Academy voting. Um, 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 like the animation branch, which votes for them, but I don't know. I mean, they I, they were all well done. It's not it, I, it's not like a Finding Dory where I think people were a little bit like mixed on the movie, and that's why I didn't get it. Or a Sing, like 2016, you yeah. saw those two movies miss. Boss um, Baby. <laughs> Boss Baby got in though, but I yeah. out of those, I mean, I don't know. I think Boss Baby might have been better than Cars Three, so I think it, you know it wasn't better than Lego like Batman, but I don't know Boss Baby. Boss Baby wasn't the worst thing. Um, no, it was, it's just odd to say Oscar nominee Boss Baby. Yeah. Well, Oscar nominee Ferdinand was also that year. You know? Yeah, true. I mean, everything everything after Oscar nominee Fifty Shades of Grey really doesn't have the same. Yeah. yeah. Or Oscar winner Suicide Squad. Yes, that's the other one. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. You, you currently have Encanto winning. I think I would still stick with Luca just because Pixar. Never doubt him. I, yeah. I want Mitchells to win, though. That's my favorite of them all easily. I love Luca. Luca was great. Luca and Encanto, I really enjoyed both. So whatever wins, I'll yeah. be happy. Yeah. I'm rooting for Mitchells. But I'd also like Luca to win. Um, and then also, we're going to quickly, since we saw Jared Leto in House of Gucci, talk about supporting actor. Because according to lots of people, he's the front runner for some reason. Um, yeah, this is just a... This is... I haven't... what In my time of um, talking about the Oscars, which hasn't been super long, I haven't really seen a situation like this with a category where there's like... Usually there's at least like one person who you're like, okay, well, they're at least going to get nominated. Um, I have no clue. If you look at my top 10, I, I could say any of them could be nominated. I wouldn't say any of them are locks. Um, yeah. Well, because the front runners don't really have strong supporting actor nominees. So you're like, no. what do you go with? You know, Power of the Dog doesn't well, really have one. I mean, Cody Smith McPhee is good and I have him in there, but yeah. I don't think he's, he's like, the thing that I always imagine is like, I have to, I have to see in my eyes, in my mind, the person with the Oscar in their hand and I can't for the life of me do it with this category at all. Yeah. Yeah. The only one right now who would be my number one who I could possibly see it would be Bradley Cooper for Licorice Pizza. Um, I know lots of people say he has a small role in the movie, but lots of people also say he is um, like a huge standout of the movie. We've seen people win like Judy Dench for small amounts of screen time. So it's certainly possible. I mean, he's been nominated so many times, so they could finally see, a, see this as his time to win. Um, but then behind him, I'd have Siren Hines for Belfast, John Bernthal for King Richard, um, Jared Leto for House of Gucci, sadly, and um, J.K. Simmons for Being the Ricardos would be my top five currently. I, I like that list. I, I'm not, I feel like that could be the list. Um, I have Bradley Cooper in my number two position. I think what helps mm. him is that he's never won before, and it could be yeah. just an Al Pacino hoo-ha, yeah. know, instead of a woman win. Um, I currently have my number one position, Richard Jenkins, the human. Yeah, yeah. Certainly he's possible. just an actor I think they want to award. He's such a wonderful actor. He's been nominated like, twice before. The movie's small. The movie's um, like dead. Small. Like, I know, I but it hasn't that. really opened yet, right? Like it still could open. True, true. And it's A24. I don't know how much faith I have in them. Yeah, yeah. we'll see. I don't know. Maybe that's just hopeful because I think the other yeah. nominees. Yeah. Lots of know. people still have him in there. We'll see. I, that's an aspirational pick, I feel, at this point, because I really don't know. But I think yeah. he could, because, I mean, it's a, a Tony-winning play, I believe, so it probably has a great opportunity for – I mean, look at Anthony Hopkins and The Father. You know, it was a great yeah. role. People doubted, but it was a great role, and people like him. And I think Richard Jenkins – it would be great for Richard Jenkins to have an Oscar. He's so deserving. He's great in Shape of Would've Water. Been. And, yeah. he, and I think Richard Jenkins has helped because he's also in Nightmare Alley. So yeah, like, I'd honestly, people. I would say he's more likely to get nominated for that than the humans personally. But Possibly. We'll see. We have to see Nightmare Alley. But yeah. I, the fact that he's in two movies, maybe like Laura Dern in 2019. Could help, know. yeah. Um, Kieran Hines is my third. He could win. He, it's a very emotional performance. Um, it's a true supporting performance. And I think people like him. He's, he's a working actor, yeah. like Jenkins. He could go. I, I honestly, maybe I'll put him in my number one spot the more I think about it because he could get in there. Yeah. I think Cody Smith, Nick Fee will go along for the ride. I think he's really strong. I think it's hard for me because I'm like, you know, despite what we think of them now, you know, Timothy Chalamet gets in, but Army Hammer doesn't. You know, a lot of times the actors that help, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch is not as good without Cody Smith, Nick Fee. But whether yeah. the Academy re recognizes that is still yet to be found. So maybe he gets in. I, currently, my fifth spot, I have Jamie Doran. The more he keeps singing Neverlasting Love, and True. all these press junkets, they're just singing it a lot. Yeah. Um, and again, it's a very emotional, reson emotionally resonant performance. So yeah. possibly. I also think we've seen a, a tradition now of two nominees in like one supporting category from the same film. 2018, yeah, it happens, yeah. 2019 with the Irishman, 2020 with Judas and the Black Messiah. The yeah. past few years we've had that. Maybe it happens this year with Belfast. Um, Certainly possible, yeah. And then I haven't even seen the movie, but I'm hoping Woody Norman gets in here. I believe that's That would name. be nice. Come on, yeah. come on. But I don't think it will happen. I think Come On, Come On is going to get a screenplay nomination and that's it, if that. Yeah. So, if that, yeah. 
yeah, this category is really all over the place because again, as I said, I think that, you know, it's, I think it's hard to, none of these performances I think are shocking people in the ways, no. you know, Jared Leto would have been that if the movie was good. Yeah. Um, and if he was good. Yeah, but like you look at the other categories like Kirsten Dunst, Katrina Ball, Anjanou Ellis, they all have big scenes. Benedict Cumberbatch, yeah. Will Smith, Denzel, Andrew Garfield, Leo, Javier Bardem, they're all big performances. That doesn't mean like they're not, they're devoid of subtle or nuance. But they're big performances. Nicole Kidman, Kristen Stewart, Francis McDormand, yeah. Alana Heim. Like again, the supporting actor just seems to be. It's it's actually funny. I think for once, the supporting actor category is going to be made up of supporting performances, not yeah. lead contenders in yeah. supporting. So maybe that's why it feels so like empty because we're used to seeing lead performances get in this category. That actually is true. Pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be interesting. The early awards yeah. will definitely decide who, who what the difference will be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. I'd also say look out for someone in West Side Story, maybe like David Alvarez or um, Feist, I believe is the other actor. Um, the spoiler alert for West Side Story for almost yeah. a six year old musical. Bit, three, yeah. came, two, came out a few years ago. Yeah, it came out a few years ago. They die halfway through. So it doesn't yeah. like... You're, it's just that's the thing with them is that like Ariana DeBose and Rita Moreno will have the big their big scenes at the end of the movie that's why I feel stronger yeah. about that Mike Face and David Alvarez I think is their names they are, they'll probably be great but they die halfway through it's not gonna yeah. help it's the issue it's the reverse of the Irishman where De Niro's best scenes were at the end but nobody made it to the end and so they just remembered like what they saw and they saw Pesci and Pacino. Yeah. With this, they're gonna make it to the end. It's West Side Story. They're gonna see it in theaters. And so they'll forget about the boys by the time they get to the end. True, true. And then Jason Isaacs for Mass. That's just not gonna happen. Not gonna That's happen. more of a lead trying to get in supporting. J.K. Simmons bit. could though. It's how strong- I think J.K. Simmons will, currently I think he'll get in there. Just cause I, I think, think that movie is a big contender overall. And yeah. J.K. Simmons one a few years Javier ago. Javier Bardem and J.K. Simmons are both on the bubble for me. I'm like, they're either in or they're yeah. not. It depends on how strong being the Ricardo is. It's tricky with Javier. I don't, I don't know. I think he's definitely my number six. I, I swapped him out for Leo because I think they just love Leo. Yeah. And Leo's gotten nominated for every movie he does. I mean, he got nominated for Hollywood, Revenant, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. He people miss. say he's the standout of the movie. So. That too. It helps. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so that's supporting actor, you know. We'll have to see how that goes. Um, definitely the most interesting to track right now of all the performance categories. Um, and then the yes, Q&A. Yeah, we've got Mario contending for chocolate. Oscar. For time. Don't yeah. confuse shit with the chocolate. Oh my yeah. God. If that gets nominated, if that wins, oh. If that wins, I'll be very upset. Like, oh I would God. understand. No, Jared Leto, I love you. I, I love the risks you take. Please, God, no. It's not a mark on Jared Leto. It's a mark on the movie. It's whoever didn't support him. I think it's kind of a mark on him, too. He's, I don't like him as an actor and what he chooses to do, especially off offset. Very, um, it's very, he's, yeah. it's a, uh, he's a provocateur. He is, yeah. Yeah. So getting into the Q&A section, I only posted this like an hour ago, so we'll see if we even have anything. Um, we do not. Sorry, I should have posted it yesterday, but oh well. I don't know what anyone would even ask anyways. There's not a ton going on. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for this week. Unless, do you have anything else you'd like to add, Anthony? See Power of the Dog when it comes on yeah. Netflix on Friday, I believe. Definitely. Yeah, this Friday, December 1st. Yeah. I'm Check watching it, it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much it. That's it for this week. Um, like the video. Um subscribe all that fun stuff comment down below tell us how um how right our gotham wars predictions were we'll, we'll find out in a few hours um and yeah totally wrong that's that. yeah probably totally wrong but who knows maybe we got them all right and um, give us your supporting actor choices because oh I mean, my god yeah this is yeah. such a difficult category and do you think it's because it's truly supporting performances this year or do you think it's a different reason i mean that's just my read um, yeah yeah interesting interesting category that's for sure yeah so do all that stuff and come back next week for another episode of weekly oscar talk maybe we'll be able to get ben back in here at some point hear oh. his thought get his get
get to get his hot takes in here. I'm sure he he'll, hates Power of the Dog. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, <laughs> he'll definitely be here for Don't Look Up because he's he's very excited for that movie. He should be at least. Right. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next week.